Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Alan Worden. I'm the founder of the Nantucket Data Platform. And uh, I want to start with a few examples of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the city of New Orleans had a question, which was how do we reduce the number of deaths by fire? So to save lives, what they figured out they needed to do was figure out where fires were likely to happen. So what they did was they looked for zones in the city where fires were more prevalent. They overlaid um, an economic analysis that looked for lower income families where buying a smoke detector was a real economic issue. And they identified households where there were elderly or infants because they're the ones who suffer the most in a fire. And they laid this all out on a GIS. They identified the zones of most risk. They handed out free fire detectors, smoke, smoke detectors. And now they have a series of success stories of how lives were saved. I'm going to give you a business example. Burt's Bees, and we've probably all used that lip balm, figured out that when the wind blew from the north over seven miles an hour, and, uh, um, and the temperature was dropping, that 80% of their product was sold. So what they figured out is they watched the weather patterns and they were able to micro-target consumers who would want their product and now they're number two in that category. So our goal at the end of all this is to figure out some questions and that's where we need your help. What are the questions we need to answer as a community and what data can we imagine, can we discover, can we curate uh, to help answer those questions for government, for business, and for nonprofits. So what is the idea? The idea is uh, that you know, we have a belief that the creation of a reservoir of reliable data can be used by those three customers I described, small businesses, uh, by nonprofits, and by government to make evidence-based decisions. And the observation is that there's lots of data around, and, and maybe when you leave here, what will happen to you is what's happening to us, which is you imagine data as you walk through town. There are, there's data on, uh, from the DMV, there's data from property records, there's data from the GIS, there's data from the public schools, there's data from the hospital. But it all lives in silos. And so a lot of it exists, it doesn't need to be created, but it needs to be curated, it needs to be aggregated into a platform and then made available to the community. And so our idea is if we can do that and then we can supplement it with national databases, uh, then we could have something of real value. And then the third thing we've tried to do is to develop a team of demographers and data analysts who really believe in the idea that that data can improve the human condition, uh, and then get them to focus on our little island. So there's, there's our title, Big Data for Small Island. And, uh, and so I would um, uh, commend to you the things that are on your chairs, uh, just to orient you to it. There's a program, if you open, uh, open uh, the inside, you don't have to read everyone's biography. I can tell you they are wildly skilled demographers, data analysts, thinking partners, and advisors. Um, who have spent the last two days helping us figure this thing out. And um, you'll also find a card um, with the back is blank, and you can either fill it out today or you can um, send it back to us or email us. Um, but we're trying to get ideas. We're trying to get questions on how might data improve our community. And uh, the last fun part of it uh, is the last page of the program uh, you're going to meet uh, Joe Smolowski. Joe is the chairman of our advisory board, um, and uh, he has got access now to Streetlights data, and you're going to meet the Streetlight folks, and we're basically uh, sending him to a 30-day program where we can wean him off uh, using this data uh, late into the morning. Um, and he has figured out uh, who from what location goes to which beach, and you can connect those in the way we used to as a child, connect the you know, the red with the apple and the yellow with the banana. So you'll see that on the back and that's sort of in the fun facts category. Um, so what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna try to explain to you a lot about big data in a very short amount of time. And I thought maybe the first way to go was to show you a 60 second video 
and see if we can get everyone oriented to what big data is. The world is becoming increasingly digital space. Today, we manage, share, and store our lives online. <coughs> data is gathered from our devices, computers, and smartphones that collect and transmit information on what we do. And that's really what we've been trying to figure out for the last year. How do, we, how do we identify the information and how do we turn it into knowledge? So we really think there are two keys. One is a process and the second is about people. So our process is pretty simple. We're gonna try to mine data, we're gonna try to identify hyper-local data, and then we're gonna merge that with national databases. We're gonna analyze the data, curate it, uh, make sure it's accurate, and then we're gonna share it with the community. And uh, it really is a tool that has not existed. Uh, we had a lot of meetings today where people said this didn't exist a year ago, this didn't exist two years ago. So it's not as if this is a hammer that's been laying on the shelf uh, that no one's used, it just hasn't existed. So we're trying to be pretty innovative and take the best practices from a variety of communities and a variety of professionals and figuring out how to use it uh, to Nantucket's benefit. In terms of people, um, Joe Smolowski, I mentioned, he uh, is the chairman of our advisory board. He spends a massive amount of time on this project as a volunteer. He's the former chief data officer for Citigroup, so he actually knows this stuff as opposed to the rest of us who are all learning. Maybe with the exception of Peter Morrison, who's our chief demographer, many of you know him. He was with the Rand Corporation for 30 years, and uh, I will be indebted to him forever for bringing uh, some amazing demographers to our island to help us figure this out. Uh, Christine Farantella and uh, Samantha Reese are our data miners who are dutifully going out meeting with uh, uh, town departments and searching online for data sources. We're cataloging those. And Melissa Philbrick is our first customer, uh, which was very helpful because we needed a customer to keep this enterprise going. And uh, essentially what Remain asked us to do was to figure out what is the effective population of Nantucket. And so that summary is on your chair. Uh, it was written by Peter Morrison, and it was uh, based on uh, a con conceptualization that was done by a, a now friend of ours, Jonathan Schechner from Jackson Hole, who also came for the weekend to help us figure out how to actually write this paper. Um, and, uh, and I think we're making good progress. So the real goal is to introduce uh, some of the team uh, that are described in your brochure. So the first um, firm and folks that we're going to have come up are uh, people from Civis Analytics. Civis grew out of the Obama election campaigns. They were known for using data as a way to share their message with voters. Um, and so Christine Campingato is uh, here. She's the director for uh, their applied data science. And she oversees the work for a lot of nonprofits and government organizations, political organizations. Um, and she was involved in the 2008 Obama campaign in Ohio where Obama was severely behind and uh, arguably by using data and being smart and getting the message out, uh, he ended up winning in the general election. We're going to hear a little bit about that. And her car colleague, uh, Scarlett Swerdlow, uh, leads a team uh, that is also uh, focused on the public sector. And uh, she's helped uh, with any poverty programs, one of which you'll hear about today. Um, and college savings accounts and how to increase the use of those and how to connect middle skill workers with training and jobs. Streetlight uh, is gonna go next and uh, they bring travel patterns to what we're doing. Uh, you'll be fascinated by the way they use GPS and smartphones in an anonymized way. Joe will talk about this a little bit. 
uh, to understand how people are traveling. And that's where Joe got the information on the program about where people, uh, if you go to Surfside Beach, most people are coming from where. If you go to Sconset, where most people are coming from where. So we've started to look at ferry uh, locations and where people uh, come from and where they go to when they get to Nantucket. It's fascinating stuff. And we're going to hear from Catherine Manzo, who's a senior director. Um, she's been at Streetlight. I think she was employee number three. She was also at Walmart and worked on a lot of their sustainability work uh, around the world. And then we're going to hear from one of Peter's pals, uh, Warren Brown, a demographer from Cornell. Uh, he is consulting with the US Census at the most senior levels. And he's also volunteered in his town. So he spans the experience of the census. It's something we'll talk about in future presentations. But uh, the 2020 census is a huge opportunity uh, for this community. And we're going to do whatever we can to support uh, support that effort. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my pals from Civis. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's been a, it's my first time at Nantucket in, on Nantucket. It's been beautiful. Uh, and getting to meet the team that Alan's put together has been a real privilege. So I'm really excited to uh, get to talk to you very briefly today about some of the work that we've done and what we're excited to do uh, to help this initiative. Uh, so I have been working in the field of data science for about a decade. Uh, as Alan mentioned, I got my start in 2007 uh, in the Obama primary campaigns. I started in Iowa and ended up in Ohio. And even in that short span, I have watched the industry in the field shift dramatically as they were talking about even just a couple years ago, some of the things that we're talking about here today didn't exist. And so uh, if you ask today 10 data scientists what data science is, you'll probably get 10 different answers. Uh, there's you know, big data, data miners, data engineering, data science. Uh, but for us at Civis and for us on the campaign, it came down to something pretty simple, which was using data to make better decisions, letting data inform decisions that were being made. And so that's a simple concept, but it's actually pretty complicated in uh, practice. And an example of that is that on the 2012 campaign, in order to execute on this simple concept, uh, the Obama campaign had a team of 100 data scientists essentially supporting the decisions that they were making. And today, uh, looking back, it might seem kind of obvious that an organization so big and that political campaign in particular would have made such an enormous investment in data science and data analytics. Uh, but at the time, it was so uncommon, even just five years ago, it was so uncommon that the campaign considered it a uh, secret advantage that they had, even going so far as to keep us in a back room that uh, had a door that closed and no sign. So when reporters came to tour the office, they would close the door and they would not mention that they had 100 engineers, analysts, data scientists, et cetera, in the back crunching numbers and supporting the campaign because to them it was the secret advantage. Um, which seems funny now, but really the whole narrative about data emerged after the campaign ended because the campaign went to such great lengths to keep it a secret. Um, but that work, all that effort to keep it a secret um, did pay off in a lot of decisions that the campaign was making. And so just a quick example of this is that uh, Michigan was a state that was not competitive. Nobody was really paying a lot of attention to. In 2012, it was expected to go blue for Obama, and not a lot of money was being spent there. But in the summer of 2012, Governor Romney had a series of very successful rallies, uh, huge turnout, lots of excitement. Um, the media started to pick it up. There's something happening. People are really excited. A poll came out, a public poll came out around Labor Day that showed the race, which was previously supposed to be non-competitive, at a dead heat in Michigan. And so as you can probably imagine, uh, you know, and there's a narrative like oh, the Obama campaign's behind. They're going to have to catch up. Uh, they're making a surge in the Midwest. And as you can imagine, inside the campaign, this was launching hours of heated debate and passionate debate because the stakes were high. And so there were people yelling at each other. There were people with decades of experience saying, we should be going into Michigan. We shouldn't be going into Michigan. Uh, because as you can imagine, like one dollar spent in Michigan is a dollar not spent in Florida, for example. These are, these are difficult decisions. The stakes are really high. And that team in the back room with the door shut uh, was very, we were very clear and steady and we said, the race in Michigan is not tight. This is not where we should spend money. No data is showing us that we should spend money. None of the data that we're collecting and investing in is saying that we should spend money there. And so the campaign didn't go into Michigan. 
And I don't know if people remember the exact details, but in Michigan, Obama won by eight points, which is essentially a landslide in a presidential campaign. Um, it didn't even crack the, t I think 14 states were more competitive. And so what I think is interesting about the story is not that 100 of the country's greatest data scientists could see an eight point win coming. Uh, what I think is interesting about the story is that a billion dollar organization was willing to put faith in that process and in that data um, and in that team to guide really high stakes decisions. So when we came out of the campaign in 2012, uh, when we started Civis with some uh, seed investment, our goal was actually not to bring what we had done on the Obama campaign to other organizations because we recognize that uh, most organizations can't or shouldn't be hiring 100 data scientists to support their decisions. Um, but what we felt and believe and have executed on in the year since is that if we invested in the R&D and the technology and the infrastructure necessary to support smaller teams of data miners and data engineers and data analysts, uh, that they would be able to focus on the important stuff, on informing the critical decisions, on helping leadership understand what the data is showing them, and uh, that with that infrastructure, they would be able to leverage a team of 100 data scientists. And so uh, we have worked with, in that model, we have worked with Fortune 100 companies, we've worked with governments, we've worked with other political campaigns, we've worked with charities and large foundations to help them use their data assets um, to accomplish their goals. And so with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Scarlett, who's gonna talk about an example of one of those projects that I think has some uh, interesting relevance here, and hopefully is. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, so let me make sure I know how the clicker works before. Okay, I think I've got it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a project we did with an organization called the Robin Hood Foundation. Um, some of you might be familiar. They're a New York City-based foundation focused on uh, alleviating poverty in the city of New York. And their model is they want to invest in proven programs uh, to have the greatest impact possible on reducing poverty. And one of those programs is something called uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a tax credit that goes to lower income individuals, primarily families with children who have some earned income. Um, and Robin Hood Foundation came to us with a question. They knew they wanted to launch a campaign to increase participation in the Earned Income Tax Credit program. Uh, there are national statistics that, despite this being a really effective way to help lift people out of poverty, that about one in five people who are eligible for this benefit don't actually claim it. So they knew they wanted to launch a campaign to try to increase participation in this program um, in New York City, but they had some questions. Uh, the sort of most essential one was, well, we know nationally about one in five people who are eligible don't participate, but what about in New York City? How big is that participation gap? Um, who are the people that are eligible but not participating in this program? Where in the city do they live? What are their lives like? Um, so that we can tailor our efforts to them. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, um, people who are eligible for this type of program but are not participating in it are sort of by definition a hard to reach population. Uh, there's not some list out there that we can kind of go and access and be like, okay, here are um, all the eligible people, we're gonna cross check it with people who are claiming it, and then here you go, you need to just talk to these 10,000 people. Um, that's not something that's possible in this, in this case. Um, so we knew we were gonna have to be creative about the data that we were using and the methods that we were using to, to try to answer these questions that Robin Hood Foundation had. Um, so just as a starting, let me show you kind of where we started, like coming into this project, here's sort of what Robin Hood Foundation knew. There we go, okay. So they knew for New York State uh, that about 17, 18% of people who were eligible for the earned income tax credit were not claiming it. Um, so you know this is like a somewhat useful statistic. They know like there's a gap in New York State. It's maybe slightly smaller than the gap nationally. Um, but if you are the Robin Hood Foundation and you care about New York City, uh, it doesn't necessarily very helpful to know what's happening at a state level. Um, and even if we were to know what was happening just within New York City, that doesn't really help them think about how do we allocate limited resources? Which neighborhood should we focus on? What community organizations should we be partnering with? Um, so our goal in this project was we needed to get a lot more granular than this uh, in answering their, their questions. Um, so a big way that we did that was leveraging a lot of data that was available. 
Uh, so we started with some more traditional data sources because those are going to provide us with a really solid foundation for, for this type of analysis. So we started with things like the American Community Survey from the U.S. Census. Um, but we supplemented that with information um, from the IRS. Um, we leveraged a lot of data from New York City's open data portal, including 311 calls, uh, where different ser city services are located. Um, we scraped uh, the locations of all of the tax preparers in New York City, so all the kind of H&R blocks, places that people might typically go to get assistance with, with their taxes. Um, and using that data, uh, as well as some kind of different methods, um, which I won't, won't go into here, but I'm happy to talk about uh, later. Um, our sort of first pass is we were able to go from that New York State view to this New York City view. So we went from the whole state to New York City, and then even more granularly than that, because these are actually, um, the census term is public use microdata areas, PUMAs, um, but they map very closely to New York City's community districts. So we were immediately able to provide Robin, not immediately, there was some work that went into it. <laughs> but we were able to provide Robin Hood Foundation with a much more granular view. Um, so it wasn't just knowing this is a problem in New York State, now it was knowing that this is a particularly significant problem in certain areas in Queens. Um, or one of the more interesting things we found um, is there were actually areas of Manhattan which, you know, you would think maybe this isn't a problem there. Um, but that these were areas where at least our theory was that uh, maybe there aren't as many eligible people, uh, but the people who are eligible are not really being served by nonprofits there because people just like don't think that they would need the need would be there. Um, so that many of those eligible people were not claiming this this particular benefit. Um, I will just make a mention that like in addition to getting more granular geographically, we actually also changed the sort of metric that we were using. Um, so here you can see we were just looking at the participation gap. So this is, of all the eligible people, um, how many aren't participating in the program. And when we moved forward, we actually looked to something um, which we called non-participation density. But you can imagine a place might have a really big participation gap, but maybe there's also just a really small number of eligible people. Maybe that's not a place to invest a lot of resources. Um, but by looking at this density metric, we both got a sense of how big is the gap um, but also, like, what's the potential opportunity? If Robin Hood Foundation invested resources here, um, how much of a difference could they make? Um, and ultimately, we went uh, even smaller. Um, so we actually went down to a census tract level. So this is one of the Manhattan neighborhoods that we had identified as sort of having a higher than average non-participation density. And we were able to drill down and actually look at what are the census tracts, so kind of the areas with maybe a few hundred or a few thousand people that the partic that participation problem was largest. And then we're able to map that up with some of the information we collected early on about what organizations are there that Robin Hood Foundation might want to partner with, um, what community institutions exist that could be sort of a brick and mortars place to offer services. Um, what are the demographics of these areas to suggest maybe who are going to be key community members to, to join in in this campaign. Um, so I think for us, like one of the uh, lessons that we learned from this project was that you know, there was a part of this project where we were collecting a lot of data. Um, but ultimately, what really mattered was working with Robin Hood Foundation to kind of really hone in on what's the question you're trying to answer? Um, what are the metrics that are going to kind of give you actionable information? Um, and how do we report on and provide that information back in a way that they're going to be able to use it? So in this case, they can literally see, like, these are the neighborhoods we should be in. These are, like, the street corners we should send uh, organizers to to talk to people about these programs. These are the organizations we should partner with. Um, so keeping that, how do we make this actionable um, kind of aspect in keeping that in mind was, was really important to turning this from a project we were just collecting a lot of information to something that our client could, could leverage. Um, so with that, I will turn it uh, back over to Alan. Oh, Catherine, great. Oh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine from Streetlight Data. Uh, thanks to the Nantucket Data Platform folks for bringing us down here. It is not my first time here, but my first time taking Cape Air from Boston. Very interesting. I'm glad the weather was nice last night. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Streetlight Data. If I'm going to go 
pretty fast, do a high level overview. So if folks have more questions, you want to talk about us, uh, talk about more with me or my colleague, Paul, who's over there, please come find us afterwards. We're happy to answer any of your questions. But fundamentally, what we do at Streetlight is we have a um, big data analytics engine and a platform that queries or asks questions to that engine that describe mobility patterns. So like we heard earlier, there's a lot of different definitions of big data. But what we use at Streetlight is this mobile data. So in the past five to 10 years, this data resource has exploded. So this is data coming from cars with in-dashboard navigation systems or smartphone apps. Um, and it is really describing um, real world travel behavior as people go about their daily lives. So empirical, actual information. Um, and this is a really massive, large set of, of devices out there, millions and millions of devices in the US alone, tens of millions, I should say. And it allows you to look at not only really um, widespread travel behavior, looking throughout an entire state, an entire region, but also allow you to get really granular. Um, and there's a lot of powerful insights that you can get from this, some of which are already on the back of your, um, uh, your program. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of more examples as well. So this is an overview of Streetlight Data's technology. Um, again, happy to drill down deeper with anyone that really wants to understand. But the basic gist is we are bringing in um, this locational data um, into our system, and it's all anonymous. So we don't have any personal identifiable information, which is really important. But we're getting these pings from all these devices as people just go about their daily lives. And then we bring in other data to help contextualize or make sense of that. And we mix it all up in our uh, route science data engine, where we clean up all the data, we um, normalize it, we try to make sense of it, and then we aggregate it up so we're only describing groups of people moving around, never an individual, which is really important when you think about these data resources. And then all of that is then accessible via our Streetlight Insight cloud-based platform, which is what the Nantucket data platform folks, and Joe in particular, are gonna be using to try to better understand insights about Nantucket to, to help with decision making going forward. So here are some things that I learned quickly this week when I started running some analyses for Nantucket. Um, this heat map is not that great, so I'll try to describe it. I know it's a little bit washed out. So, First question was, where do people come from that are coming to the island? And one of the places I looked at was all the uh, parking around the Hyannis Ferry. So all the ferry parking, where are those folks coming from? Where do they start their trips that end at the ferry parking? And specifically for a typical day over June through August of 2017, which I know is kind of the, hot, the you know, high season here. So you see that folks are coming from lots of places. New York pops up. We have Maine popping up all the way back in Albany. Let's drill in a little bit more. So this is now looking at more Rhode Island and Massachusetts. So what you do see is when we're looking at some of the, you know, kind of immediate origin, you see a lot of folks were probably doing other things in Hyannis before they then went over to the ferry, but all the way down to Provincetown, all the way up to Boston, et cetera. So this was just one quick analysis that took just a couple of minutes to run. So now everyone, uh, you know, the Nantucket Data Platform and its partners are gonna be able to do this stuff at their fingertips really quickly. So how far though? So the spatial map is interesting sometimes, but sometimes you just wanna know, okay, how far are people traveling? So now we're looking at weekday on the left and then weekend day on the right and seeing how far people travel. So interestingly, there's a lot of locals or at least people that were doing things locally before they drove to the ferry. But you have folks that have traveled from 100 miles away that have ended their trip at the ferry, which is really interesting. So I, I, I didn't know what to expect when I ran these, and I thought this was a really interesting breakdown from you know, this huge percent of under five miles, which is 41%, all the way up to 6% driving more than 100 miles on an average weekday. And the biggest change really is there's a jump up to 11% on the weekends, perhaps not that you know, unsurprising given the weekend destination is. So again, kind of one little insight you can get from using this massive data. And here's another analysis I did, and I hate to admit it, but Joe kind of stole my thunder with his um, analysis of all the beaches and the top zip codes. But I was trying to think of just one area to look at in Nantucket without knowing the beaches that well or other areas. I just looked at the airport. So who, people that showed up at the Nantucket airport 
On a typical day in June and July, just those two months, these are the metro areas that we believe they live in. So we're able to infer where we believe people live based on their movements and patterns of their cell phones. So again, no, no personal information. We don't actually know this for sure, but we're inferring it. So Barnstable shows up there. Oops, let me go back. Go back. Barnstable shows up down there, but New Jersey, Boston, Bridgeport, DC, et cetera. Um, and probably the most interesting one I thought was, oh, San Francisco, uh, Oakland um, area, or the whole kind of metro area around San Francisco pops up there too. There's just one level of geography. You can go down to the zip code, um, a lot of other things. So giving you a little bit more sense for who these people are spending time here. And then the last analysis that I did, here we go, was once people get to the island, what are they doing? So there's a lot more that can be done here, drilling down into how people are using the, the road network, thinking about transit planning, um, things like that. But here's a very, very simple analysis with little one kilometer grids, half mile grids. When people that were then at the neighborhood downtown, you know, right near the ferry terminal, where are they going? So this is on a typical weekday morning in June and July. So a lot of folks end up going right here. I do not know what that is. I'm sure some of you do. Um, in these other orange areas. And what you can see is that this is kind of yellow areas right here. And then green is, is kind of the lowest. So this is, meant to, this is a heat map, but it's a little bit hard to differentiate the colors. Um, so I don't know, between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., folks that are at the ferry and around that downtown, this is where they then go. Probably the kind of main employment centers of the island, things like that. But what about the weekends? So now we see something very different. Um, first of all, more blocks are filled in. They're going to more places on the island, but also I do know that there's a lot of beaches right around here, right? So for folks on the weekends that are coming there now, we're still seeing this kind of central part of the island. Again, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but then they're going wherever. Um, and again, <laughs> yeah, is it the stop and shop, right? Uh, maybe, oh shoot. And what you can see is these are, so this one's yellow, 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 these ones. So again, more people are showing up. Think of a heat map of starting near the ferry and then ending up there. So this is just kind of a snapshot of the sort of things that um, now Nantucket is gonna be able to get easy access to. I literally ran these in probably 15 minutes um, just through the cloud-based platform. So it will be really exciting to see kind of what y'all end up doing with our system. All right, that's it. set my timer too because as a college professor I'm pre-programmed to talk for 50 minutes. Uh, anyway, as, as a, a demographer, Peter Morrison has always been one of my heroes. Uh, I first met Peter when I was in graduate school. So the opportunity to come here, when Peter, when Peter calls, you come. Uh, you know, it's a great opportunity to work with one of the, our best applied demographers. Um, so the challenge however, was that I'm supposed to tell you a humorous story. Well, there's not a lot of humor in demography. <laughs> I, I only know two jokes. I'm going to tell you one, and later you're going to have to ask Peter for the other one. So what's the definition of a demographer? A person who's been broken down by age and sex. <laughs> and in reality, not that we've been broken down, but the first thing when somebody tells you what the size of the population is or how it's changed, we immediately want to know some of those basic demographic characteristics. What is the age and what is the sex composition of the population? And that, that little bit of information tells you a whole lot. So what I want to do is to share with you a, a couple of stories uh, about communities that, that I've worked with in my career. First one comes from my experience at Cornell in New York State, and uh, we were doing a project for the governor's office on brain drain. There was a big issue that in upstate New York, we're losing our young college-educated population, and they wanted to know what's happening, where are they going, how can we stem that outflow? So we met with uh, a, um, a county legislators in their uh, statewide association. 
And they were of the belief that it was the high cost of living, high property taxes, high property values that were driving out the young people. So in preparation for this, we took a look at census data. Both of these examples use census data. So we took a look at the census data, the micro data that uh, you were referring to earlier, which asks a question, where did you live one year ago? It's great, great uh, information for this kind of question. Well, those young people were, were fleeing to such low-cost locations as Manhattan, Brooklyn, Boston, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Chicago. You have to be careful that you're, you know, you've, you've got a preconceived notion as to what the problem is and, and, and how we're going to fix it, but check the evidence first to just either confirm or to readjust. Those county legislators, I don't know that they ever readjust it, but anyway. Uh, they're not as, as adaptive as you folks here in Massachusetts are. You know that about New York. All right, the second one, for uh, three years, I, had, I left Cornell and I went to the University of Georgia. Uh, after three years, Cornell recruited me back, paid me more, gave me a better position, and I said, good, it worked. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Tybee Island. I don't know, how many of you have heard of or know about Tybee Island, right? Off the coast of Georgia by Savannah. Uh, and Tybee Island, the, the, uh, the way that sales tax uh, receipts are distributed in Georgia and, and in many states is that not on the basis of where they get collected, but on the basis of population. And they were angry that the census had continually undercounted them in 2000, you know, 1990, 2000, and the census estimates were too low. And uh, so I went down there and I met with them and, and they had been adding to their housing stock, they were growing with their housing, uh, and uh, they had about uh, 3,300 people in the 2000 census. And we looked at all of the houses. We assumed the same occupancy rate as had been experienced in 2000, the same persons per household rate. And I was confident that that Tybee Island was going to come in at over 4,000 people in the 2010 census. Lo and behold, the 2010 census comes out. They went from 3,200 down to 2,800. How in the world could that happen? You added to your housing stock. What had happened was you know, a lot of seasonal housing, okay? So 60% of the housing stock in 2000 was occupied by year-round residents. Usual place of residence is the way the census says. Where is your usual place of residence? Well, what had led them to believe that there was such growth was the fact that uh, a lot of the older couples and, and single people were selling their homes on Tybee Island to younger people with families. And they said, you know, this, this is going to really fuel the growth. What happened was the occupancy rate went from 60% down to 40%. That drop was due to the fact that they were no longer, the people who bought those homes were no longer year-round residents. These were now summer homes. And so they were being counted in the other locations, Savannah and Atlanta and other areas, you know, that Tybee Island drew from. Uh, and it was quite a shock to them. So, uh, you know, what was the solution? Well, you know, you, you, you can't require those younger families to become year-round residents. Uh, you know, part of the solution might be to seek some sort of relief. You've got to provide police services and various kinds of services, and yet you're getting less of the, of the sales tax. So uh, staying on top of what's happening, what are the characteristics, what's the age and sex composition of your population, and how that might work through to change your population and your dynamics, that's just part of the picture that we're trying to get at with census data, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about the importance of census data. But anyway, it's a real pleasure to, to, to be here. Uh, I, I wish I could spend more time, but uh, I'm going to have to go back on, on Sunday. Anyway, look forward to talking with you all.
So we're in the panel discussion part of our program, and I'd like to invite the speakers to come up, as well as um, Bill Clark. So I think you've met um, everybody through the introductions that Alan made, but we have one new member of the panel, and it's Bill Clark to my left. Um, and Bill is a research professor at UCLA, uh, focusing in on geography and demography. So really happy that you can join us um, in the panel. And I wanted to start with a question that is most likely on all of our minds. Um, I think you've heard the word anonymized, um, and, um, and the, the question that um, folks have it revolves around information privacy. Um, and when we speak, and you see the slide that um, Catherine showed, a little you know, phone that was emanating um, signals and they're being collected, could you just tell us more about how you um, protect um, privacy, especially because this will be an important um, aspect of our program? I'll take the microphone, sure. Um, so privacy is very important to streetlight data. Um, so Alan mentioned I was the third hire. I was actually the second hire after our two co-founders, but our first hire was a VP of privacy who specializes in geospatial data privacy. So the number one thing to know is that even though we're getting data from different devices, it's totally anonymized. There's no personal identifiable information. We don't know that it's Catherine Manzo's cell phone or anything like that. So any other thing that we do is all about inferring who we think these people are based on where we think they live or things like that. So we have no PII, which is an official term, in our system, doesn't come anywhere near to our stuff. And we've also built our whole technology with privacy by design, which is a Canadian certification um, principles, which is really important. And at the end of the day, anytime you run an analysis through our platform, you'll get back information about groups of people. So it will never let you analyze an individual movement, or if you try to, because people do, put your house in there and try to run that, our system will flag it and will say, sorry, you can't do that. So privacy is an important thing, um, and we take it very seriously. And when you were thinking of that red spot on the map, um, that is actually stop and shop. Uh, <laughs> and um, and um, it would tell you that um, visitors, um, that their either preferred time or the time that they shop is between 10 and 2. Nantucketers go before 10 or after 6. And for whatever reason, we seem to go, you know, there's no preference um, in late afternoon. Um, so it makes, makes a little sense when you think about the ferries arriving um, and the schedules and why you might see um, that red spot um, on the screen. Uh, I began um, focusing on big data not that long ago, um, seven years ago. And, um, and it introduces a whole new series of uh, terms. Um, and I asked Bill if he would talk a little bit about some of these terms uh, and location-based data, which is the information that emanates from mobile devices is um, one of those important terms. So what is it? Um, how is it being used? Um, and in Bill's case, um, he has worked um, not only in the United States but in Europe um, on this particular topic. And I thought maybe um, just a, kind of a 101 um, discussion of um, location-based data. Keeping it very brief, uh, you're all used to the notion of your street address. We've, we've grown up with street addresses, and you can think of them, this is, this is where you're located, this is your place. And geographers, of course, have always been interested in that geographical data. You, you need to think also that that street address actually is a latitude and longitude. We've always had latitude and longitude, and you can get a latitude and longitude right down to the, the meters of your, your street address. And the story I like to tell is you know, about the, the, the prime meridian, which runs from Greenwich. It actually runs through my sister-in-law's house, who lives in the southern part of London. Uh, this, is, this is very detailed geographic data. We've always had this notion of latitude and longitude, but it wasn't until we had satellite technology that the notion of geodata, of data, geographical data, that could be coded and utilized really came to the fore. And that's what stimulated the whole big data notion, because now not only do we have detailed data on people, but we have it on people in places. 
So in fact, the privacy issue becomes very important because increasingly we have the data on specific locations. And of course, in Europe, where I also work, they have population registers. So you register, and all the data on you as a person is in the register, and it's also geocoded. So they know exactly the geo address that's associated with that data. So this, of course, is the challenge of how to use this data on, in Sweden's case, 10 or 11 million people that's all geocoded, and how then do you construct neighborhoods and places and utilize that to inform decision making? Because as you may recall, Europe is going through this, this process of trying to absorb millions of, of migrants being disrupted by the destabilization in the Middle East. Those immigrants are coming into places and settling. Governments want to know how do we provide language for these people? How do we provide health care? All of those myriad services come down to knowing locations and concentrations of population. And so geocoded data becomes a very important part of big data. Christine, as you were speaking, you mentioned that you were um, a data scientist. Um, and um, I think of the movie Mrs. Robinson. Um, and if you remember that movie, um, the one word was plastics. Um, I think today, the one word, um, if you have a young person going to college or looking for a job, might be um, data. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe describe, um, when you hire data scientists into your company, what are the backgrounds of the individuals um, and uh, those that are more successful in this particular field? Oops, should I come up? Uh, I, can, uh, I can stand. Can you stand? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. So at Civis in particular, we... Uh, one of the great things actually that's happened over the last decade in education in general, in higher education in general, is that the value of data and the skills necessary to work with it have, uh, where they, they used to sit in specific disciplines. So economics, for example, which is my training, or in computer science or statistics, obviously. Um, you're starting to see it in programs across disciplines. So now we have people come out of uh, political science departments knowing um, advanced statistical languages or coming out of uh, sociology, coming out of different departments. So we, um, we hire from a variety of different backgrounds. It's actually something that we uh, pride ourselves on in that we are bringing both people with the uh, technical background of a computer science degree and putting them in a room with somebody with the social science background of sociology or demography, for example, um, or survey research or political science, and people with MBAs who have an idea for uh, market context or relevance. And so um, in terms of educational background, it's increasingly running the gamut, and especially just in the last couple of years, starting to get people out of undergrad programs or, or graduate programs. Uh, beyond that, though, the skills we look for are, um, I mean, I could go very technically, but um, being able to work with um, messy data is increasingly important, uh, something that we find sometimes, especially in an academic environment uh, with younger people, is they're used to working with a data set that was curated and given to them, and they're trying to answer a specific question, and so they run it on that data set, and the question is conveniently in that data because the question was designed by somebody, um, but that's not how the real world works. And so um, we're increasingly looking for people that have experience with messy data, unstructured data, large databases, et cetera, and we actually test applicants before we interview them um, in order to uh, look for those skill sets. We speak about data science as if it's new, um, but um, counting systems go back um, thousands of years. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure if this is an age thing as I'm picking on, on, um, on Warren next, um, but uh, we have maybe one of the most important um, data gathering activities that will be um, occurring, which is the 2020 census. Um, and what I asked if Warren um, would talk a bit about, um, first of all, the census itself, data that's collected, and why it's important to the community to try to uh, have as accurate a census as possible. So the United States, uh, our first census was conducted in 1790, and uh, we have the oldest continuous survey uh, census of population. 
Other countries have done them before, but not in a continuous manner. And so we've done them every decade. Um, I was not around in 1790 to help with the census. Thomas Jefferson, my good friend. Uh, but uh, 1980 was the first one that I was involved with professionally. And so this will be my fifth one coming up. Uh, you know, in addition to representation in Congress and allocating seats, it's used for allocating uh, local voting districts. So political representation is, is, is probably, you know, the most important. Secondly, it's used for allocating uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 billion worth of federal funds uh, to states and local governments. Uh, and it doesn't stop there because a lot of, you know, as, as, as I mentioned before, uh, there in Tybee Island and in many areas, states and local governments use it to counties to allocate it to subdivisions within the county, although you, you're in the good situation here of being both the county and the town. So whatever comes to the county comes to the town. Uh, so, and then there's private investment that, uh, you know, people, where, where are we going to build the next hotel? Where are we going to invest uh, our, our resources? Look to census data, and not just the decennial census data, but a lot of other products that are derived from them. Uh, and I think what's so exciting about this exercise is the new types of data and other kinds of information that's being brought to bear. But almost every one of these has some connection to the census data to sort of square up or uh, you know, used in, in estimating. There's two critical components to the census. The first one is the address list. Does the Census Bureau have the address for every single living quarters that's in your jurisdiction? That is a, a, a critical first step. And the Census Bureau is going to share their mailing list, which is protected by federal law. If you're going to be one of the ones to work to review that address list, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement. You have to sign up. Your government has to sign up by December 15th, this year, in order to have access to that mailing list. And then beginning in February of next year, they're going to send out each mailing address that they have and give you an opportunity to review that list. If you complain later that, well, the Census Bureau didn't know about this place, well, then for pity's sake, sign up and tell them about that place, okay? So that's an opportunity that the Census Bureau is reaching out to local governments for help and assistance with. Then the second one, which is a real tough nut to crack, is getting everyone who resides within this area, whether they're a citizen or not, uh, you know, whether they're uh, here as a student, but if it's their usual place of residence, to complete and respond to the census form so that you get them counted. So I wanted, and you emphasized um, December as an important day as part of the process. And when I think about the census, it's April 1st of 2020. But an awful lot of preparatory work occurs from that. And the town has a responsibility to ensure that, um, that you've got a good starting point, which is the, uh, the address list. Um, Peter, um, you've been in the field of demography for quite a while. And, um, and I'm just wondering if you could help us um, with a reading list. Um, and, um, and I think of, you know, the books that I've read over time to help me become more familiar with this topic. And I was wondering if there are one or two things that you would recommend to the group that um, they could read to gain a better understanding of, um, of this area. Sure, I, uh, but I still have to uh, fill in uh, for what Warren said before he said there are two, uh, two definitions of what a demographer is, and I'm going to give you the second one. The second definition is a demographer is someone who works a lot with numbers but didn't have enough personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so having, having said that, I will share with you, I, I will start by saying that one of the great things about Nantucket for me and I think for all of us here, is we have a great Athenaeum, and when you 
uh, read a review in the New York Times book review about something that is a great book you gotta, you gotta read, you go down to the Athenaeum and it's sitting there on the shelf and there's no weight on it. So one book that I would recommend very highly, which I read about two years ago, is a book by Nate Silver, who is the guy who writes in the New York Times periodically about, he's, he's kind of the, one of the guys who delves into the election data. And the title of the book is The Noise and the Signal. And what he does is he examines kind of the ingenious ways in which you can look at all those election poll data and discern the underlying truth and eventually come to some judgmental conclusion about whether Obama is going to win or the other candidate is going to win in a particular place. And he called it right most of the time. That was a great read and I would highly recommend it. Did you want a second one? Sure. All right. The second one is a more recent one. You know that the Nobel uh, Prize in Economics was uh, just awarded to Richard Thaler, uh, who's a professor at Harvard, as I recall. Well, I don't know if he's, yeah, I think he's at Harvard, but University of Chicago, sorry. <laughs> sorry, University of Chicago. But he, uh, his co, right, right. Uh, and Richard Thaler is, uh, has written uh, a, a book entitled Nudge, which again, you can get at the Athenaeum. And this is a great read. Uh, it's, you know, it's absolutely uh, just mind-boggling the kinds of things that have developed in economics in a new field called behavioral economics, uh, where we start to understand that uh, contrary to what most economists say, we do not behave rationally. We behave according to habit. And once you understand the habit pattern, you can gently nudge people in directions that make life better for all of them. So I recommend that as well. Yeah, so the, um, the noise and the signal, that's uh, one of my favorite books. Um, and, um, and sometimes when you read the cover, you think it's gonna be about statistics and you're gonna go back to college and be reminded about some of those courses that you weren't either interested in or you, you didn't do as well in. Um, but it's a series of uh, very interesting stories. Um, and it will go from the Red Sox in terms of the way they um, responded to rebuilding the team in the late um, 2000s, um, political um, arena, the, um, the weather arena. And, and while it's not covered in the book, um, kind of applying the lessons there, um, if you look at the Golden State Warriors, which is a basketball team, um, and they basically changed their approach to shooting based on data analytics. Um, and by examining shots that had been taken forever, um, they understood the trade-off between taking the shot from one inch behind the three-point line to one inch on the other side. And you'll notice today, that the centers uh, in basketball teams, in pros, don't play as great a role as the shooting guards that are around that perimeter. And that is um, a direct result of doing data analytics, um, looking at the history of shots taken by um, individuals, by individual players um, over time. Um, Christine, I'm gonna go back to Ohio. Um, and um, and um, I'm gonna, the, the, the last poll, uh, before the general election, um, basically had um, the state, if you look at the New York Times, NPR, the Cook Political Report, which is um, kind of a gold standard, um, said it was a toss-up. Um, um, MSNBC actually said it was gonna be um, the Romney, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, McCain. Um, and, um, and I'm just wondering about maybe that tense discussion that you had where you needed to balance data versus judgment um, and what that, either that night or the night before might have been for you. Well, I went through election day in 2008 on uh, no sleep, so I kind of blacked it all out, but I'll try, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no, it was a really um, emotionally fraught time. Ohio was uh, the most hotly contested state in the country. And um, when they called Ohio on election night, it was the tipping point, essentially, when they called the presidency. Um, but it wasn't so smooth going up to that, as you mentioned. Um, actually, I remember very vividly that the uh, in the morning of election day, 
exit polling started to come out, and exit polling is, you know, questionable in its reliability. Nate Silver actually has a lot to say about this topic. Um, but the exit polling was saying that uh, Obama wasn't going to win. And we had had polling all along that said he was going to win, and we'd obviously invested heavily in the state, and we did everything we can, but the exit polling came out. It said Obama wasn't going to win, and um, my stories somehow always end up with me hit hiding in a closet, but like <laughs> behind, you know, hidden behind a room. Uh, but the state director called me into a closet, literally closed the door, and we called um, David Axelrod and David Pluff, who were the chairs of the Obama campaign, because they were like, what's going on down there? And we didn't want the rest of the team to hear everything, because um, I think by that point, what we had recognized is that we had used data along, all along the way to inform decisions. Uh, we had put our best resources forward. We had placed things out. and the team panicking at that point wasn't going to change anything. And so we, we had this conversation in, the, in this closet on the phone, and um, what we decided to do then was move volunteers from one, you know, based on what some of the polling was coming out, uh, move volunteers from one area to the other, but we did not actually, uh, truly, I'm not just saying this in retrospect because I know how it ended, we truly did not believe that we were wrong. Um, and I think we, we gave that message back up to headquarters. We said we've had the data all along. We put resources where we need to be. We're executing. Um, all of the data that informed the decisions on election day had been made. Uh, those decisions had been made, and we were now executing on that plan. And uh, and so we, um, yeah, we moved the resources and just kept steady. And it has a happy ending. So it's a good story to tell now. <laughs> I only asked you to, um, to um, kind of describe that situation because when people talk about um, big data or data analytics, they at times think that's becomes a substitute for, um, for human judgment. Um, and it's the combination of the use of data, your experience, um, and those two things together gu should guide your activities as opposed to simply saying, I'm going to look at the scoreboard and the scoreboard's going to tell me what to do. Um, and this is an example of you know, while you took um, certain steps to maybe deal with a potential issue um, that between your experience and your judgment, um, you felt confident that in the end, um, the um, President Obama would win. Um, and uh, as it turns out, he won by a number of um, percentage points. Um, this is a new effort, um, and, um, and part of a new effort is always communicating to the community. And Scarlett's background, um, she was a reporter at one time for the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, she was also a communication director for the Arts Alliance of Illinois. And if you think about the communication challenge um, that we have, what would be a couple of things that you think we should be thinking about? Sure, so I think that kind of a few, a few thoughts on this. Um, so I think first of all, like the most, uh, important thing is thinking about how the data that you all are collecting like relates back to people's lives and the decisions that people are trying to make um, and the issues that, that matter most to them. Um, I think uh, data in and of itself, I mean, can be, can be interesting, um, but really it's how it connects back and how it illuminates something. Um, and I think to that point, uh, it's quite, it's sometimes easy, and, and we suffer from this a little bit in uh, the kind of data science field, to just sort of think, like, we'll just collect all the data, and we'll, like, put it into a machine, and we'll turn a crank, and it will tell us the answers. Um, but there really is no substitute for, uh, you know, having some point of view about this is how the world works, or this is a thing that, that I care about, and letting data inform that, and you can update your beliefs as you learn new things. Uh, but having that connection uh, is really, really important. There's no point, I think, in like collecting data just for the sake of collecting it or analyzing it sort of just for the, that sake. There should be an end, an end goal. Um, the other thing I will say, um, this is actually something that Nate Silver talks about in his book, so a little Nate Silver fan club up here. Um, <laughs> but he talks about the importance of communicating uncertainty. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's quite important in general and is something that I thought about when I was... Um, you know, writing at the, the Sun-Times is that, um, you know, you can use data to tell an overarching picture, um, but there's variability underneath that, or there's uncertainty around the data that's been collected or how accurate it is. Um, and it's, it's easy to ignore that and just kind of paint over it. 
Um, but that's, that's also very important to acknowledge um, you know, where are their caveats? Where are we unsure? Um, we were talking earlier about, you know, there are going to be known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, so sort of trying to illuminate those and acknowledge those. Um, and that was actually something we had to do in our work with Robin Hood Foundation. Um, there, were, there were times where, you know, we had to say, um, these are the, the limitations that we're facing with the information that we have. Um, we're putting an answer forward that, you know, we have confidence in, um, but we also think these are the risks of, of kind of this information, um, potential limitations, kind of things we think you can and can't say confidently. So um, thinking about how to communicate both that variability around, around data uh, as well as uncertainty is also um, really important and recognizing that there's a lot that lives underneath whatever those, those data points are. spent all of yesterday, today, in kind of detailed working sessions on how we move the Nantucket Data Platform Program forward. Um, in fact, tomorrow we have another set of working sessions that begin at 8.30 and wrap up around 2. Um, but eventually, Bill, you'll be going back to Los Angeles. Uh, you'll be going back to Colorado. You'll be going back to um, Ithaca, New York. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if you could offer us, if there was one takeaway or thought that we should have um, as we continue to move this um, program forward, you know, based on what you've heard. And Bill, I didn't warn you about this question, so I apologize for picking you first. The others can think while I'm talking. I think the emphasis here is on community. I mean, this is what comes out of what you want to do with this. It's to pick up on the last comment, was that it's about how you can use data to inform and do things for the community as a whole. It's, the data doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's there to be used, and I think clearly from the turnout here, you have people interested in the community and how you can deal with the fact that the community is going to change. It's not going to be the same as it was 25 or 35 years ago, as much as we might like to turn the clock back. I don't particularly want to turn it back. But I think you have to look at this as a community that understands how it can change and use data to help inform those changes. Or if you could give it to Peter, uh, I can. Um, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to inform the way government decisions are made, and we can. Uh, help make them evidence-based decisions. I know there are a lot of decisions we make and people say, do we know anything about X? And the answer seems to be, well, not really. We sort of assume this or we assume that. Uh, we think there may be as many as 60,000 bodies on island in, a, in the middle of August, but we don't really know. We just know how much garbage was generated on that particular day. And I think the form of government we have is really well suited to having uh, evidence-based decisions. And I think of what happens in annual town meeting. I was uh, telling Bill that I said, in annual town meeting, we have this old form of government. And what will happen is somebody will say, well, we want to spend X millions of dollars for a new fire station or a, a new school or a new something or other infrastructure. And some old salt will stand up in the back and say, how do you know what about X? What do you know whether X is true or what the number is for X? And it's a reasonable question to ask, given that there's a lot of money being spent. And what I'd like is for the Finance Committee or the Board of Selectmen to be able to say, we know what that number is, or we've got a reasonable estimate of what it is, and when you know that that's the number, you can see the wisdom of the decision that we are making or we are recommending to spend X millions of dollars on some piece of infrastructure that's going to make this community better. Um, so I would say um, this is really cutting edge stuff, what we're talking about here. 
what Streetlight's doing, what civics folks are doing, and I think um, the Nantucket Data Platform, I really give you all a lot of credit for coming up with a very collaborative, innovative approach to saying, hey, we wanna be on the cutting edge, we wanna use this new data and these new resources to make these decisions in the best way possible. So I would say keep doing what you're doing, bringing in outside folks that are um, experts in different areas, learn from them, and really, I mean, you guys will probably end up being this amazing case study of how um, a seasonal, uh, you know, a community that has a lot of seasonal impacts is is trying to move forward with their decision making in, in a in a you know more innovative way, if you will, um, and really to help make lives better. So keep doing that, and I bet more and more people will learn about Nantucket that don't already know about them. Yeah, I can only second what you said. I mean, I, you know, in my 40 years of professional uh, work with communities, I've I've never seen a community with, that has been able to pull together the talent that you've got represented you know, by the names in this folder. I mean, it's a dream team. I, I, I feel like I'm getting to work out with the Golden State Warriors. I just, <laughs> I, I, I just wish I could stay for the season. But uh, anyway, don't let this opportunity go by. This is a wonderful uh, team. Um, I mean, I echo everything everyone here said, but I'll say to the people, uh, the, the people here tonight to fill out the cards, uh, they didn't tell me to say that. Um, it's really what I think um, because, um, for example, Alan told a story about Burt's Bees noticing a pattern between sales and wind speed. It's not actually the case that every piece of data in the universe exists somewhere and you just have to like reach and grab it. Somebody had to think, did wind speed affect sales? Somebody had to have that idea and so I bet ideas like that exist out here tonight and so um, I think that my advice would be to continue with the open sourcing of ideas and contributions because um, until somebody has the idea to test something, it may not get tested. And I guess to echo that, to build on that also, I would say um, to continue to make it a space where failure is okay. Like maybe wind speed isn't correlated with sales and it's okay that somebody spent a little time thinking about that and looking into it because you will find something that is there. Um, yeah, I think I would, uh, kind of building on that, you know, just, uh, you know, say that I think this will, this will be successful because of um, the ideas that you all bring to the table and because the work is then applied and relevant to those. So having that insight into what are the questions you want answered, what are the decisions that you're making that you feel like if you had more information you could maybe make better decisions, um, that will, I think, help, uh, you know, ensure that this whole project is successful. That's the, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the panel discussion. The panelists will be here um, after we um, wrap up. If you've got any particular questions, I'm going to turn it over to Alan, but can we give the, um, the panelists a round of applause? Well, thank you so much. I was going to tell you to fill out your card, um, so thank you for that. We, we need good ideas. I want to just quick thanks. Thanks to all the town department. Andrew was there. Um, the, uh, Brian was there. Uh, Catherine was there. So we have a lot to learn. And everybody was super uh, helpful and collaborative. And these guys came up to speed very quickly on the opportunities and challenges we're facing. Uh, I'll thank Westmore uh, for hosting. Uh, I want to thank our advisors and trustees. Trustees are providing intellectual capital as well as actual capital to keep us going. Um, and uh, I, I want to encourage uh, you all to reach out to everyone on the panel, and particularly those of us who live here. This is the start of a conversation. Uh, there are known unknowns, and I love that whole phrase. There's so much we don't know, uh, but we're fundamentally learners. So if you want to learn with us, we'd love, we'll keep you informed, give us your email, uh, and we'll try to make progress together. So I think the bar is still open. Yes, the bar is still open. Uh, thanks, as a friend of mine said, well, maybe this worked because it was uh, date night with data. This is a national statistical holiday, I guess, in the US. This is National Statistics Day. So, have, <laughs> total coincidence. Someone told me that an hour ago. So, uh, have a drink to celebrate statistics and have a great weekend. Thank you so much. <laughs>